Hello and welcome to Chatty AF, the anime feminist podcast. My name is Vry, and with me this time around to discuss Michiko and Hachin is Amelia, Jax, and Lizzie, who are our very special guests, and we're really glad to have them. Uh, would you guys like to introduce yourselves? I mean, I'm not that special, <laughs> so I'll go first. Um, I'm Amelia, I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Anime Feminist, and I'm usually hosting these, so this is really nice to just take a seat and let Bri do all the work for this one. Um, and I'm involved because I am a person of colour, which you probably can't tell from my voice, um, and I don't see myself represented very often, so I was really excited to be involved in this one. You can find me on Twitter, at Actually Amelia, and the rest of my work is done mostly through my wonderful team at Anime Feminist. All right. Hi. Um, you, on social medias, you all know me as that nerdy Boliviane at Lizzie Visitante. You can call me Lizzie. Um, I, I guess plugins like I used to write for Anime Complexion until it shut down. You can find some of my old republished work on sojopowers.com and my newer stuff on Black Girl Nerds and at Anime Feminist. I identify as a Quechua Mestize. Um, and I'm so happy that we can talk about this show. And last but not least is my pronouns, they, them, she, her. So, yeah. Um, my name is Jacqueline Elizabeth Cottrell. I'm better known as Jax. I work with Noir Cesar Entertainment, LLC. We are a Black-owned company that is dedicated to creating anime, manga, and everything in between for a more diverse audience. So you've got anime, manga, etc. created by people of color and featuring people of color, especially black people, you know, because we notice that there is a enormous disconnect between the amount of black culture you see in anime, manga, video games, etc. and actual black people. So that's something we're working to rectify. Plus, we also just want to bring a lot more to the table as far as showing that Yes, we as black people are very nerdy. I don't know why that stereotype is still out there that we're not, especially black women. And as the only female on the team presently, um, it means everything that I be the voice for black women, nerdy black women, as well as speak on my experiences and help the company to grow. So I'm very excited to do this anime. And yeah, thank you guys for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yay. Oh, I forgot to... Uh, quickly, my plugs. I'm on Twitter at Writer Rye, <laughs> and I po- co-host another podcast at Trash Pod. Anyway, moving on. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you for reminding me. Um, pronouns, they, them, she, her, he, her. It doesn't really matter to me. And you guys can find me on Instagram at Jack Jack Attack. Um, J-A-X-J-A-X-A-T-T-A-X-X. And Noir Cesar, which is just Noir, N-O-I-R. And then Caesars and Julius Caesar. So yeah, done. <laughs> yes, check them out. They're pretty rad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yay. All right, so as I briefly mentioned in the opening spiel, this is our watch along for Michiko and Hachin, which I am very excited that we're finally getting around to doing it. Um, I think previous podcasts have proven that I am a giant Sayo Yamamoto stan, and I think this is by far her most overlooked series, and it definitely deserves some love. Uh, So mostly I am going to turn turn the discussion over to you guys, but before we get started, a little bit of production history, because this is... Something of a weird gem. It originally aired in 2008 in Japan. It didn't make it over here until 2013 because uh, it did very poorly in Japan. The DVD sales did not even chart. It was produced by the late Monglo, which was always sort of the studio that took risks on unique projects that were pushing the boundaries, uh, pushing the envelope in some way or other. Uh, This is the premier directorial debut of Sayo Yamamoto. Uh, She was approached to do sort of a road trip action series. And as, as she described in her interview with our very own Caitlin Moore on Anime Feminist, uh, this became her way to discuss what she called the rawness of women, which I think you see a lot in her portrayals of the main characters of this series. So it's 22 episodes. I'll be, it's somewhat unusual in that the three main actresses who play um, Michiko, Hana, and Atsuko are actually live action drama actors who this is for at least one of them their only anime role. And they are primarily known for their live action work, which creates an extremely different feel if you're watching the sub. Which does remind me, uh, how are you watching the series? I'm watching it as dub 
because we don't actually have it available through one of the anime streaming services in the UK, so I'm having to watch Funimation's upload on YouTube, which is dub only, I believe. But it's a good dub, so I'm quite happy with it, actually. I have mixed feelings about the dub, honestly. <laughs> um, not saying that from a snotty point of view, like, nope. not saying that from a fierce point of view. Just as a black woman, I have a couple of issues with the dub. We will absolutely discuss those, because don't, don't take what I'm saying it's a good dub, as it's entirely unproblematic. We've been talking about it on the Anafem chat all morning. <laughs> Okay, and um, but for the most part, I've been watching it. Um, I kind of like to balance it out. Certain things I can watch with the show. I've been able to kind of go back and forth with it, but I definitely say I prefer the um, the subtitle as far as the dub. Mm-hmm. That that's interesting. Um, actually, if, honestly, as long as we're talking about it, if you want to bring up your issues with the dub, go for okay. it. With anything that portrays women of color, I always get frustrated when you don't actually have a woman of color voicing yes. her. So then you kind of get a very right. whitewashed and almost insulting kind of tone you've got you've got essentially what is known as vocal blackface and that's what i don't like and that's upsetting because monica real is one of my favorite voice actresses i follow so much of her work and so it was a bit frustrating to kind of just hear and the other and the one who voiced the uh, i can't think of her name to save my life right now but i was really listening to see i'm like okay let's see how they think you know afro-latino women sound and uh, it was kind of miss with me because I'm so used to hearing just over exaggerated accents when it comes to trying you know I mean because essentially what you've got is like I said it's vocal blackface you've got Mm -hmm. a white voice actor trying to portray a person of color character and it loses its authenticity and it almost feels kind of insulting it's just like you guys couldn't find a single you know voice actor who fits this role instead of just going with somebody generic who's got like a ton of things like under their belt no disrespect to Monica Rial. But that's honestly one of my biggest issues with POC characters in dubbed anime, which is why I try and stay away from it, because I just have not been impressed with it in the past. And yeah, I've I've been watching it subbed just because when I did hear the, the, the dubbed version, it sounded really odd to me, mostly because like it's just it's not like the way the characters talk is not how I often hear like folks of community ever talk to each other i mean yeah we curse and all this crap right but um it just didn't sound as authentic to me i I felt like a lot of nuance was lost there and um yeah like um i don't know much Mm -hmm. to be honest i don't know much about dubbing work because most of the stuff i watch is mostly in subtitle anyways because i like to listen to stuff in the original language as much as possible but um yeah like um i don't the voice actress Mm -hmm. for michiko when i like um uh, I don't remember her name now, but I was watching the extra about it. But uh, like, I was kind of surprised to find out like she is she's Spaniard, right? She identifies as as Hispanic. Yeah, she's she's done some interviews about apparently this role was quite close to her yeah, heart. Though of course she's not Afro Latinx. Um, I know, this is where I feel I have I feel all kinds of way about folks who are Spaniard. Like in a way, like I'm like you guys are from. They're, they're not considered part of Latin America and the Caribbean, right? Because there's a huge distinction between that. I mean, there's a, whole con- there's a whole conversation about, like, Spanish, Hispanic, Latino, Latina, and all these, and the variations of gender, like, gender uh, neutrality. But typically speaking, like, you know, oftentimes mm-hmm. Spain always wants to be included in the conversation, but they're not. Like, we have a relationship with you guys through our history of colonization, Right. But you are not. But but thanks to that, we have a really really fucked up like um, current socioeconomic political histories that we are trying to deal with, right? So I always feel really kinds of way mm-hmm. like f- when I when I hear like Spaniard folks always try to get themselves involved in a conversation that's not necessarily they shouldn't be a part of, you know. But that's just me, like, mm-hmm. in terms of, I can't speak on her voice acting work. For all I know, she's a really great person, right? But I, I felt, <laughs> for like, but for me, though, it always mm-hmm. feels kinds of way, like, you really couldn't find anyone of that, this diaspora to, like, voice act, like, the, ca- the, char- the character Michiko in the show. Because I feel like, really, there's, you couldn't do that, mm-hmm. but, yeah. No, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to, to hear you guys discuss that. Um, I, I have ended up watching the dub this go around because just for me personally, um, you know, I don't have that connection, that understanding to to be put off and, and, and hear the wrongness of it. But for me personally, I found the sub really hard to watch purely because it is so naturalistic. And for me, at least, the, the sort of 
livelier acting of the English vocals made the brutality a little bit less gut punchy. Yeah. This first episode is really hard to watch. It, it, subtitled like I, I um I was watching it with my partner and I felt just horrendous because I had I had forgotten that the first episode of this show it needs really strong content warnings for child abuse and, and that uh, somehow came through as as a lot more very serious uh, with with the very naturalistic subtitled acting which is amazing they're all very good actresses uh, I guess are we gonna get into that now okay uh, yeah so I, I guess that does kind of lead me into Amelia you are the only one who is watching this for the first time yes oh no no I'm watching it for the first time too oh thank goodness oh okay so who wants to go first <laughs> yeah how, how well let's start with uh, Jackson Amelia since this is your 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 very first experience with this how are you feeling so with these six I first episodes want to put my cultural context really clearly because it probably isn't to anyone who hasn't met me doesn't really interact with me on twitter um i am mixed race from a white british and south asian background so i don't even have the south asian cultural context right my mother was like immigrated at a very young age and so i am kind of fully from a british perspective so there is going to be a lot here that's really new to me however just the experience of seeing someone brown on screen, specifically a brown woman who looks remotely like me, like not to flatter myself because like she, you know, she's an anime character, she looks amazing, but she is actually the same skin color. I could hypothetically try to do a cosplay of her without feeling really weird and uncomfortable out of it myself. So that experience is very unusual for me. And that has absolutely been what's stuck with me these six episodes. Um, it's really enjoyable to watch. I'm looking forward to the next six. It's really hard to watch at some moments, but in a way that feels earned and relevant to the story. So I'm I'm having a great time watching it so far. How's it been for you, Jax? Um, well, with any anime I go into that has a woman of color in it, especially a woman of color, if she's supposed to be, you know, Afro-Latina or what have you, I really look for stereotypes. I look for continuous misconceptions like I'm always ex I'm always I always put something under a microscope because I feel like there's so much in when it comes to being a woman of color in anime that you have to kind of like it's like all right what in here is likely to offend me it's like I can't go in there just blindly like oh my god yeah it's gonna be dope I'm gonna watch this with no prejudices because then I see certain things and I'm just like oh my god I can call that out as anti-blackness or I can see that this was maybe a bit insensitive like you know if I feel a certain way about it it's not me nitpicking and picking and choosing it's just me looking for the same elements in any anime that's featuring a woman of color that i've seen that have been offensive in the past that have been repeat repetitively problematic while at the same time being able to enjoy the show now years ago interestingly enough and i noticed that there was some whitewashing in uh the series in the first several episodes which i was which i was really excited about prior to me being more conscious and being more aware of, you know, looking for that sort of thing, I would have just gone into this blindly thing. Oh my God, this is great. This is a woman of color. This is exactly what I was looking for. This is perfect. And it means a lot because I know that I've also seen several sources say that Michiko's um, inspiration, her design was inspired by Aaliyah, who is one of the most <sighs> famous black R&B artists. So of course I was all on top of this because, you know, when we lost Aaliyah, it was a huge, huge, huge hit. You know, and Aaliyah was a nerd. She was an anime and manga nerd. Like, one of her music videos is in anime format. And it was just such a refreshing blast from the past. So that was something that I could carry with me, being excited. You know, something that I could look at without, you know, judging it too harshly. But, I mean, it's been a very interesting experience. I love it. It's so upbeat. But at the same time, I'm keeping my eyes open for the same things that I'm used to, you know, seeing when it comes to portraying anime and women of color. So it's something I'm keeping an eye out without trying to entirely spoil the series for me. I kind of want to just raise the, the, the matter of the phrase woman of colour. Because I think you're talking specifically about the way that black women are represented. And I think that's really important to distinguish between... Like, because woman of colour technically refers to Japanese women as well, right? So I want us to be really clear when we say woman of colour who we're talking about because there are certain tropes that absolutely, like black women are treated very unkindly in media representation in general. For me, from, from my perspective, I don't, because I don't have that cultural association, I'm probably in the same situation you were in like, what, five, 10 years ago, where I'm just like, yes, brown women on screen, somebody I actually like, I'm so pleased. But I do not have that cultural baggage. So I want, 
I want to make sure that we bring people along with us when we address these things. Yes. Okay. Then I will definitely be referring to when I mean um black women. I'll just outright say black women. I am so sorry, sure. black women. No, 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 no. Please don't apologize. This is. I think this is something that I've seen come up within community of people of color talking. Like the difference between person of color and non-black person of color is pretty huge. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I want to kind of bring people along on this this with us and make sure that they're all able to participate in that conversation themselves because I'm hoping this will spark some conversation. Yeah, I feel like that's an important distinguish to have because in the context, because this whole show takes place in like a fictional uh, Brazil and um, I feel like it's important to distinguish like um, like between black like you know like people of color and black women and brown women right because from the mm -hmm. very beginning of the show like you really see the economic the, sp the socioeconomic disparity between like upper class folks and the upper class folks in the show are predominantly white pa white passing uh brazilian brazilians and the ones who are you know who live in are marginalized essentially are the black and brown folks right and uh, I think for mm -hmm. me, what really caught me in the first uh, six episodes was the use of um, religion to kind of really perpetuate abuse and violence on ha not not just Hachi, not just uh, Hachin herself, but this priest. I think his name is Father Pedro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like he not only did it towards her, but you know, like even some of the the stuff he has at home. Like he would go into like marginalized areas with predominantly like black and brown folks and would take advantage of um, especially there was that one guy who got mm -hmm. shot in the head or something like that he took advantage of this guy who's clearly un incapable of making decisions for himself in order to take from them from him t for his own like upward mobility and it just for me that uh, for me like it's it's I often see this so much whenever I visit relatives in Latin, like in Bolivia specifically, um, because religion, Catholicism is still really prevalent in all over the like Latin America and the Caribbean. And, of, and oftentimes, historically, religion has been used as a form of vi perpetuating violence against against like black folks, indigenous people, right? So for me, like all of that stuff hails back to how much was really taken from communities, whether it be it religion, religion, culture, like language, because, you know, indigenous people and black folks were like, you know, forced to stop speaking their language and were, fo and were forced to learn how to speak Spanish, Portuguese, and and what and what other have you uh, European languages that came into Latin America and the Caribbean, right? So, so like I think when going back to Verai's question about like uh, well, like um, the child abuse, like I feel like what I was seeing through Hachin was like a callback to me of the constant violence, in particular, black and brown children have been through under like the church, under the church, and all these other really awful like systemic violence against them and we it's and we don't we don't just see it with Hachin we see it throughout the first six episodes we see that happen on all like um on all these kids like um, I don't know how far ahead we're getting to in, in ep the first six episodes but those two kids that's like um that dine and dash like from the restaurant Hachin is working in you know she's being exploited but these two kids are they, they're from like marginalized areas of the favelas right and they can't afford they can't afford to pay for that food so they dash and dine right so so i just feel like we see l so many different levels of abuse that happen towards like kids in particular in this show that's interesting to just pay attention to yeah it was it definitely seems like a, a very deliberate decision to like hachin isn't just a kid they explicitly state her age which isn't always seen in anime she's nine turning ten and like there's a particular focus on dates yeah i noticed that they and, and this the, passage of time here let's know it's like this is march 9th like to like i've kept i kept tally of the dates the first six episodes focuses from march 9th to march the 31st so far so a lot has happened and just this whole thing takes place in like almost a month <laughs> that was something else um when you brought up uh hachin's age Something that blew me away from the beginning was episode one and the first couple of episodes, or first couple of, first seconds in, when they're transporting Michiko back to the prison. And I'm thinking that I'm looking at the present Michiko. I think I'm looking at the 20-something-year-old, you know, the present grown-ass Michiko. And then I go back and I realize, oh my gosh, she was 12 in that scene. But she looks so adult. 
And that's something else that kind of just made me cringe because it was like, wow. I, it, it was really it was really a just triggering moment for me. And I think it also highlights on mm-hmm. how unfortunately, like unfortunately, black and brown folks, even in real life, unfortunately have to grow up much faster than than like than like white than like white kids in some in some aspects. Like for example, like getting heavily policed in the prison, we see that the police Michiko is escaping from are predominantly like b- black and brown women who are like in the prison in the prison system, right? And you know, even when they're transporting her from whatever police station she was at to the jail, she's like in this like steel militarized kind of car while they're transporting her. And I was just like, wow, like it's it's just it just reminds me of how heavily like uh, militarized like black and brown communities are like not just in the context of north america but down south now like and i think it also greatly draws attention to the fact that that's exactly i mean think about the implications of that armored thing that she was in it also pretty much i want to say it dehumanizes very much black women yes. and brown women and yes. makes us look very animalistic and that's something else that i was going to play on as far as her being so young and being, you know, brown women, especially black women, being hypersexualized from such a young, young age. It's always, you know, oh my God, you know, you're so fast. That's something that you hear a lot addressed to young girls. You know, there are certain things that black women will not allow young black women to do because I think it's too grown. Like you'll often hear in the community, oh, that hairstyle is so too grown for her. Or, you know, that outfit is too grown. Or, you know, no, not, it's not too grown. It's just black women and brown women have been taught to be hypersexualized from such a young age. So to see Michiko be all out and about like this was very liberating, but I was also, again, paying a lot of attention as to how black women and brown women's sexu- sexuality is viewed and how they're viewed as just simply sexual and creatures. Yeah. And you know, gl- you know what? This mm-hmm. kind of reminds me, since we're s- kind of where this goes back to the topic of the kids, like later on in episode, I think, five to six, we get, like a ba- we get the backstory of where Michiko and Atsuko come from and the orphanage that they grew up in right so i don't know i think of like the kind of uh, like it, that that moment is very triggering because i think a lot of stuff is happening in when we get flashbacks of the orphanage and the current day aspect of the orphanage like in general selling the selling of children is awful right that is it's awful and i but i think what this the, that whole thing highlights for me and it comes up later in the series as well how even though this whole thing is really fucked up, I noticed that one of the things that director Zelia Bastos does is that she sells, and instead of selling the, the black and brown children, she sends, she sells the, the white children. And, um, and I think that's something to really, really highlight because I don't want to get too far into the ser- like, um because this does come back later, right? But it, but it does, rem- but it does remind me, because uh, mm. it does remind me how back then, like how often either, white like either white passing children in general like are often were often sold to the highest bidder right or are often predeemed more desirable because i just think of the social hierarchies of um how because depending on where you look in latin america and the caribbean um racial hierarchies are very different right but it's always this preference for lighter like either white passing or lighter skinned folks than let's say darker and brown like like black or brown children i mean black or brown folks right so i just feel like the whole thing for me really highlights how sinister like not just colorism but the grander scheme of like there's a term called mejorando la raza right like bettering the race right and um and the whole point of that was to make sure if let's say you are like black or brown you marry someone of lighter skin or like white passing or white in general to um better to like better your children that way they can make have a far chance of social mobility right so i don't know like like it's in, in general like enti- that entire scene is really fucked up right but but for me i feel like it just really highlighted all the sinisterness of uh that kind of mentality that goes on in the community you know it really yeah. does and it's so sickening and upsetting to get it from your own people you know to be told Especially because, you know, I'm sorry, but that's exactly what white supremacy has done. It's gotten marginalized groups of people, like people of color, black women, um, Latino women, just women of color, thinking that they have to aspire to Eurocentric beauty standards. So within that, there is a sense of self-hatred. I want to say that we have just all just been naturally taught, like, 
where darker people are just seen as just unattractive and everything like that, which is why Black Panther was such a big deal. Mm. You know, it's just always the closer you are to white, the better off you are. And as a matter of fact, you know, I would have had an issue talking about this maybe a couple of years back, but now I don't. The colorism is so strong within, I'll just go ahead and say the general brown community in certain general brown communities, especially for black women, that the one thing that I used to do is that I would play up the fact that I have English and I, English and white Irish mm. genes to make myself seem more appealing as a yeah. model. I would absolutely make sure, you know, okay, I don't want to get too dark. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do anything that might wreck my chances, you know, of losing, you know, whatever light skin privilege that I might have, which is totally a thing. But that just gives you the kind of, uh, that just gives you an insight into that type, exactly that type of toxic mindset of what it means. So of course, you know, if you're a woman of color, Michiko Nahachin is really something I absolutely would recommend definitely, but also be prepared to be triggered a lot throughout the oh, series. Oh yeah, like one of the things, and when I think in the context of Latin America and the Caribbean, like, like, like there were li- there were literal policies of blancamiento, like policies by the government to whiten the population. Like I forget which year in Brazil this happened, but I think it was in the seventies or eighties. But don't quote me on that. That there was a huge migration of folks from Europe, like to um, to co- to come to Brazil, you know, to get land and stuff. But really, this was a ploy by the government to um white to, to whiten the population because Brazil has the highest rate of black of black Brazilians, right? You know, and in the context of Bolivia, you know, like a lot of like Afro Bolivians were put into La, Las, Yung- Las Yungas and Las Yungas is a, it's a really nice place. But to get there, the road is literally called, I think, the road of death. It's it's really like I've seen I like because I didn't know what people I just recently looked it up because like I was like, how hard could it be to get into Las Yungas? And I and I saw, wow, that road is really narrow. I will die. I, I died looking at the picture, <laughs> you know. But, it, but you know, there's, like, and it's sad, but, you know, this is just, these are just two examples, but um, even in the DR, there was, oh, my God, under Trujillo, there was really awful violence against, like, um, the Haitian community under his rule, under, well, he, well, under his dictatorship, right? So, but these are just examples of how systemic this all was. These were, these were government genocidal policies, right, to try to widen up the population and to, like, eliminate any black or black and indigenous origins that we have and this is what always you know I I throw a lot of um, like I'm trying to be more vocal about stuff but this is why I have a lot of issues with the movie Coco right like yeah because like the movie Coco touches on a lot of I think good stuff but one of my things with Coco is a lot of indigenous hooks have been saying that you know you want our culture but you don't want actual indigenous people in it right or or afro indigenous people in it right because you know like the people you know, when, this is where i have an issue with latinidad because oftentimes latinidad often just is synonymous to you want mestizos which is lighter brown like mixed race folks or white passing folks to be the representation of all of us right but which is not right because we're there's so many because we're not there's indigenous people there's afro latinas you know and this is, it's like, for me, that whole thing falls into the whole ploy of mejo- like trying to mejorar la raza. And this is why I, when it comes to representation, I, f- I always feel all kind, kinds of way. Because what folks, what le- I guess Latino folks are always demanding representation, but you only want a certain kind of representation, right? Like, you know, the, you want exact, you want essentially the same people that are celebrated in Univision and Telemundo to be celebrated in the North American market, right? And that's, and, uh, you know, that's fucked up, you know, like when we're, a lot of folks are calling that shit, that crap out. I mean, Amara La Negra, thankfully, has been, has really brought this conversation to the forefront, right? It, like, I hate that she had to go through a really dehumanizing moment with that, that DJ guy in that show, like Love and Hip Hop Miami, but it was, but that moment really highlighted that this is the kind of crap that goes on on a daily basis. You know, and I feel like when I think of back to the show for a bit, like um, I feel like the show touches on all of that. How how the the adults treat the children, in particular black and brown children, is like, you know, it just reminds me so much of the real world history of uh, what constantly goes on in the community, and of course, you know, n- global wise too. I, I did want to ask you guys then uh, your thoughts on kind of the fact that that Hana as the show goes on, Hachin becomes the the kind of 
the focal character for at least the first three or four episodes and the only you know white passing character at, in what I assume was an ethos similar to Orange is the New Black where attempting to put a character in this ostensible forefront that the Japanese audience would so I, I would love to hear your thoughts on that and how you think that was handled in, in tandem with the colorism. That's tough. I mean, you you all, you all want to go for it? Um, I think the one thing that made me just upset in general about what you were talking about was that you see it often. You see, you put an extremely, you put a white passing child in this hardcore urban ghetto type of situation and expect, oh my gosh, they know exactly what it's like to experience that or have that particular experience like i cannot stress to you enough how frustrating it is to have white friends who come up to tell me that just because they grew up in the ghetto they know what it's like to be black that was something that bugged the hell out of me watching the first couple of episodes of michiko and hachin especially the ones that were focused on hachin herself and it's like listen i kind of get what you're trying to do but at the same time it's you won't get the same experiences no matter what like, it seems very shoehorned to me. It just seems kind of shoehorned in. Now, as far as the violence and everything against her, um, I'll go back to playing off of religion and just what it's done to Black, Latina, just, you know, just the result of colonization in general. Like, seeing that is so, just seeing that forced upon her, I guess just any child regardless is frustrating, but just seeing how deep religion has its claws in her, being a young girl, like, I'm sorry, but, like, religion is just not kind to women, period, to women and fans, period, which is why, you know, as a black woman, I've always had issues with religion, and it's very difficult because I'll, very much a good majority of my family are Christian and practicing Christians where my views are quite different. When it comes to just the general mistreatment of her being a child, you know, at least just a passing child, but being, you know, um, I want to say just being a child in general, seeing the violence that is shoved upon her that is how she's treated by adults in, in this world around her is just so remnant of just how black children and brown children in this world are violently violently treated from a young age because like you said just like just colors and i feel like if she had just been completely a straight white child her route in life might have been a little easier in the show is essentially what i'm trying to say like i have a lot of thoughts on it. i'm trying, kind of still trying to get them together but i mean that's just where i am for right now no no i think you you communicated like the ideas quite beautifully to tail off of that and going and talking about the themes of religion like i find it interesting that later on in the series when michiko goes to um now i had to sub separate these three into three categories because i know they're different like brujeria the, the lady who does brujeria curandismo or santeria i know they're very different i know santeria has a, a very strong african roots right I just found it interesting that, you know, like Michiko really believes in like in like what this lady is saying for emotional guidance, spiritual right. guidance and everything. And it kind of like made me feel all kinds of way. Like I feel like Hachin was just like that character who was looking outside within, kind of laughing at it, laughing at it and thinking it's funny. But I don't know. I just like that. I just think back to that scene a little bit in regards to how oftentimes I feel like outside viewers really make fun of like different forms of spiritualities that kind of help like that kind of help like black and brown folks and, and children as well get through like some really tough shit in life right so like yeah like Hachin I mean in general I do feel really bad for her and what happens to her as a child I don't wish that upon any other child but I think um, you touched on some really good points about how you know like in in the end like she's always this i feel like she's this outsider looking within even though she gr she's grown up in you know, like essentially in marginalized areas in a lot of ways i feel like she's still that character who's kind of looking at all these things and judging in a way so that that was my take on her the first six episodes because that's i felt like that's how i viewed how she was looking at michiko in a way that was kind of like you know did you feel like there was a shift in that in that two-parter episodes five and six where they're separated for a while and michiko is kind of a protagonist on her own as opposed to this figure upending hachin's life well i i, I really liked michiko on her own for a bit because like you got to really get to know her like i one of the things i really like about her is that um you really see how you know, we, we see her as a strong woman at first, but as we get to know her, we see that there's a vulnerability there to her, right? And I feel like, 
I, I think I brought up in the mm-hmm. notes about like dream versus reality and like and like Michiko is always dreaming and I feel like she has every right to dream for a space to fantasize when things are better than her current reality and I feel like she emulates a lot of that through um, this fan- this um, dream that she has on having the safe warm place with Hiroshi and Hachin right because we because we get this we see how hard Michiko Atsuko and her f- and her other friends um, oh my god I forgot his name but like that, that guy, like the, the, the brothers that own that that uh, bar but um, you know like you, you see how hard life is for them and growing up in the favelas and so like for me like that theme really resonated with me about the concept of wanting to dream right like dreaming where a world is like the world is much better than your current reality imagining a safe spaces for your communities yeah uh, on the show notes we also you brought up in or we had on the notes in tandem with that idea of dreaming this this idea of portrayals of ugliness and y- yamamoto stated s- stated intention that this was about you know women as as raw beings i i do find it interesting that there is a little Uh, or it struck me watching these that there was a little bit of a beauty is trustworthy kind of coding with the character designs and the you know there are women here who who are overweight or who are non-traditionally attractive but they are more likely to be side characters or villains or there's a problem with fat shaming in Yamamoto's work it's in Yuri on Ice too and it makes me sad (laughs) It, oh my god if we're talking about the character uh, Lula the one the little chubby brown girl um, oh my gosh like like the, what the, what breaks my heart is like we never really find out what happens to her oh, that episode yeah, is rough like, that episode is a tough Pepe sit Lima, you know like we you know she's talking to Michiko she, she's like my sister didn't come back and we just never find out we know we know what happened to Pepe Lima but we never find out what happened to her little sister was she caught by the leader of the gangs or was it or was she killed we, we never know and that's like the most harrowing thing like all these the really awful kind of violence like uh, black and brown children go through in this show you know and yeah it's scary to think of what honestly could become of her because she is a young brown girl it's terrifying to think of because nobody will look for her that's something else that's terrifying like when you re- when you don't get closer on a character like that it really makes you think okay they will not look for this nope, girl they won't and what's going back mm-hmm. um, to community and children? Like a lot of these, ch- a lot of these kids, for the most part, are belong. It's really frustrating to see how, and this happens in reality too, where a lot of these leaders look towards um, young black and brown children and recruit them into like gang violence, right? And and I feel like like the show really highlight. Like I feel like the show didn't touch on this a lot, but you see it there. But a lot of these gangs like. Pay, play, play into a lot of these kids that really want a home and a family and a community that will care about them, right? And to do that, and to and they're willing to do anything to still be part of that community, even if that means they have to kill someone with a gun. And a lot of things, like even in real world stuff, like I've I've heard a lot of even the gangs in favelas in Brazil, like a lot of instead of going to the police, because who the fuck trusts police, right? They they go to these leaders and they're like, hey, do you have money I can borrow to buy medicine for my for my kids, or do you have can you fix my roof? You know, like they often go to these folks because you know these folks are at least they were born and raised in the favelas, right? So they can go to them and trust them. Right. So but it, it just uh, it's it's so hard to see. But this is the you know, like it's like these are this is like the, this is the reality, unfortunately. And it's it's hard to really wrap your mind around it mm-hmm. of how much violence really goes really happens on young and black and brown kids in this show. And so <sighs> even leaving is hard. Oh, my God. Let's not even get into the issue of how hard it is for folks who want to leave. Right. So, yeah, that's something that I've just always noticed, particularly because it's such a trend in black and brown communities where you you have these kids who lavish, who just lavish the idea of family of having somebody who will have their back. You know, it's a very skewed. It's a very warped perception of family. Oh, yeah. So it's just like, it, that's just what draws these kids into that lifestyle even more. And, and I mean, it just goes, the hole goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. History seems to be more or less the major thematic tie across these first six episodes. You have, you know, between the, the gang issues, the orphanage, 
uh, that Atsuko and Michiko grew up in and that Michiko then brings Hachin to as a safe place. The tension between Michiko and Atsuko, which we haven't really talked about, and the fact that they have history that, that's undefined, except that Atsuko is really hella gay and yes, it's amazing. We, we can, we I love her so much. To her. Like, I find it interesting how, how differently like Atsuko chose a different path from Michiko. Like, I mean, she's, she joined the police force and has moved up in the ranks, right? And, you know, and mm-hmm. I feel like she's, I really like her. She's such this cool, she's this cool character who, it, he kicks ass, but at the same time, there is so much levels of vulnerability to her. And she cares for Michiko a lot, despite all the crap she gets her, like that happens to Michiko. At least as far as here, it, the show is riding a very fine line, at least for me, in terms of its depictions of, of queerness, which I think Yamamoto gets better with over the years. But here it's like, you know, Ats- Atsuko clearly has feelings for, for Michiko, but it's also kind of tied to her maybe being kind of a kinky person. And then Ivan is, is Michiko's friend, and he's he's also a little bit of this swishy sort of archetype later on. But, like, I'm not mad. I, I find these characters very endearing on that front, but like, you're riding on that line of stereotype at least a little bit like i really like the how the depiction of queerness is i mean yes there is the danger of stereotyping but like there's but i also know so many people like yvonne in real life and and like and i like that Mm -hmm. you know that's we like uh, these characters are queer but i like that at least like that's not the only things they are right they're they um they're explored as Mm -hmm. with as um as a whole like well-rounded characters and you know and despite everything they find community with each other and i like that i think that's one of the aspects i really like to like yvonne is very close to michiko and he's like very upset with her of all the stuff that's happened like when she confronted mm-hmm. that gang that gang and after that ensued a, a long string of violence in the community so she he has every right to be mad at her but you know despite all this crap they're still there for each other right and I think that's the part that really hit me the most that, I mean, when you look at real, like, when you look at real world history of like, for communities of color, especially the communities of color that are queer and trans, we try so hard to find safe spaces for ourselves, right? And if, if we're not, if the world is not going to be there for us, we have to be there for each other, right? I guess that's what I took away from, from that mostly, like, I felt like there was so much history between Yvonne and Michiko and like there was clear anger you know ang- all facets of emotions went went on there but in the end he still was willing to help her and you know and I like that tender moment him and Michiko had in I forget which episode when she apologizes and she puts her head on his shoulder it's such a tender moment for me because how often do you really get that kind of tender moments and like when world world stuff is being thrown at you in a really harsh and violent way that for me is where the series finds this tonal balance that i remember it for where it it has these very harsh elements that it doesn't shy away from but it's also very tender and it's also often really funny with great slapstick and really triumphant and i just yeah, like that episode I, agree. A lot. I thought something that, oh well, well going back to the sexuality real quick and how i thought they did a good job with it um i was as a queer woman, I was really, really, really impressed with how they did it. I knew from the get-go that, At- that Atsuko was, uh, that she was a queer woman, so I knew it. I could just sense it. But the dynamic that I love between Mitsuko and Atsuko is something you see in a lot of black and brown communities. You've got the girl who never quite left the streets, and then you've got the girl who kind of moved up and out of the hood. And there's always this contention between them, no matter what. It's like, oh, you think you're doing so much better. Well, not really. Oh, you know, you've gone soft. Well, no, not really. I'm just trying to do better for myself, you know. So they're always going back and forth with that dynamic that is so realistic. I think that is probably one of my favorite dynamics of the show is their relationship with one another and just how realistic it is. I mean, they're, they're so great together. They really play off of... I think a very realistic relationship and maybe not, maybe in a not so neg and maybe a not so positive way, but kind of the relationship that can be between black women and brown women. And I think that's kind of a stereotype in itself. Like that's negative when I really start to think about it because they really don't have positive interactions. And, you know, as far as the relationship between black women and brown amongst themselves, it's always, 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 you know, they're always butting heads. Tough love, I would say, right? I would say it's tough love, but I would also say it's it's an unnecessary type of 
form of tough love. Like, it doesn't need to be there. I like seeing Michiko in her softer moments. I oh, really yeah. do. She's hardened in a lot of ways. I mean, let's go. Let's go ahead and play with one of my favorite tropes. The angry black woman. Like, that's something that I don't think people realize. The angry black woman, you know, no black woman is born angry. No brown woman is born angry. But black women get the, you know, angry, angry black woman thing more than anything. And I don't think what people realize is that there's a progression to that. That builds up over time to the point where it's just like, yeah, now we don't have any choice but to be seen as hard when, you know, the strong black woman stereotype is actually very much realistically killing black women and it's killing brown women. We have to be strong all the time and stuff like that, not realizing we're so busy trying to take care of ourselves, not ourselves, but take care of everyone else and make sure that, you know, we're still intact and be that independent sort of thing that it's weighing down on us. So when I get to see Michiko in her softer moments, when I get to see Asuka in her softer moments, when I get to see those two women working together, you know, despite the banter, like, I really feel like that is the reality of the show. It's it's what's below the surface, and if you have enough awareness to kind of dissect it, along with the cultural experience to dissect it and see, okay, well, how does this make me feel, and does this pertain to a bigger, you know, problem within the series? And I think I, I love the transition to this. Um, yeah. And I think the show also talks about how it's often like our elders, like bl- like black and brown women who are the ones that take care of the family and the community and the communities. And like and I think that's what the relationship of Michiko and with Hachin and all the other like um, characters in the show, like Pepe Lima, right? Um, how much how much they really really put on themselves to take care of like you know their their children their communities and how much that as admirable as all that is it's such a heavy burden because because then you don't take care of yourself right and and it's often very damaging like I, I've seen the amount of stuff I've seen my elders do in my communities it's it's been like wow like we a- we ask so much of our elders and yet they always ask for maybe they, they don't even ask for anything in return right and they're the ones who often face the most violence right yeah. so and i think that's one of the things that really hits me on the sh- uh with michiko's character but pepe lima's character and you know other characters we'll s- we'll see in a show later but you know like and it's i often felt like it's it's so unfair too that they they're the ones that have to take on all this all this work um i definitely want to go ahead and follow up on that and bring it back to the treatment of children in the black and brown communities because something that i I saw this very recently on a post and i'm actually experiencing this firsthand is the treatment of children by their own black and brown you know caregivers parents family and stuff like that and i think with all that pressure on black women to be the caregiver to be the provider to be everything else to put herself last what you wind up with is a relationship with a child just going off personal experience where it feels like you should be grateful that i raised you that i did all this this that i busted my butt to do all this yada, yada, yada. meanwhile it's just like nowadays what i like is the black and brown kids are going like okay but like nobody ever asked y'all to bring us here in the first place so why are you making it seem like you know we're your problem we are a conscientious decision that you made outside of and I'm, of course i am excluding you know children who are products of rape sexual assault and everything like that i'm clearly not addressing them that is not what i'm saying i am talking about the black women and brown women who do in fact have children and then see them as nothing more than a problem see them as a burden the children feel like a burden and i mean it's such a vicious cycle when you really think about it but then at the same time it's just like also as a black and brown woman i can understand that progression of where having a child would lead to you spiting the child and in turn that would lead to the child spiting the parent and that's honestly what i see whenever i look at i always see no matter what i always look for the angry black woman stereotype in or angry brown woman stereotype in just anime media general media but i also look for the progression of that up to that and you can definitely see that dynamic at work When it comes to the treatment of, you know, Michiko coming up. And in Michiko's treatment, you see how she would raise the metaphorical Hachinyo as her so-called daughter. It's just interesting to watch that dynamic because the dynamic between black women and their black daughters and brown women and their brown daughters has always been just so interesting. But it's usually and often portrayed as combative. I never not see that. And I, I really like that point because it goes into like intergenerational trauma, right? Like 
how do you heal from that especially when it's a, it's a, such a systemic and cyclo um, issue in families like speaking from personal experience like my paternal grandmother was a quechua indigenous woman right she she raised nine kids by herself because my grandpa was a loser and you know and she you know i think of uh, folks like her and, and folks like her and, and her community and how how much violence they faced from like you know from either the men in their lives or the the outer world of being you know race like experiencing racism and sexism but also but also trying to make sure her kid like her kids survived a society that was not kind to folks like her right like and as a result that creates a lot of i you know there's a lot of alcohol is there's alcohol is issues in my family there's mental health issues in my family like you know there's a there's all these there's all these things and like how do you how do you heal how do you really heal from that because eventually like our elders do so much to take care of their children to the point where their own mental health suffers and by the end of her life she was a very not she was a very miserable person by the end of it right you know and and it's and it's fucked up because i i look at all the work that they did and i'm just like it's not fair it's not fair like 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 all the stuff that they've been through but at the same time i look at my my uncle my tias and and deals and i'm just like you all are messed up and then i look at myself in some aspects i'm like i'm i'm messed up as well in some in a lot of ways but how do we heal from that how do we stop that and per- perpetuate that to the next generation you know so that was honestly perfectly beautifully said because it really does it lays a lot to rest if there is or it doesn't lay a lot to rest but it just it lays a lot left to be seen what has to be done something interesting that i do want to say is that you brought up you know like the relationship between the men in the family i mean everything you're saying is like a uh, so relatable to me right now it's like it's just listening it's like yes thank you she understands this is wonderful you know and something that i find very interesting is michiko's uh fixation on what is what is her honey's Hiroshi. name Thank you, Hiroshi. And I'm like, something that I did, something I was really paying attention to was just, I mean, at times she can almost have this blind dedication to him, which is so interesting because at the same time, it's like, she's kind of like at odds with that. You can see that she's trying to keep her independence, but at the same time, she just has it so in for him. And it's, it's sad to watch because unfortunately, black and brown women are taught, make a man the center of your world and everything will be okay. And I'll speak from pers- personal experience when I said well, I wanted nothing more in my 20s and my early 20s than to find someone to settle down with, to have a kid, and to do everything that was expected of me as a black woman, what I thought was expected of me, of what my family expected of me, you know, as a black woman. So the fact that you've got Hiroshi here is an interesting dynamic as far as, you know, just how men are looked at in the black and brown communities. I thought that was something very, very interesting and then, of course, there's the overall patriarchy of the series yes. and the misogyny, the, smog- the misogynoir. Just, I love looking at that dynamic. And I definitely would have to say that is just what makes the series so just phenomenal. You can draw all of these attentions and look at all of these. It's just relatable to black and brown women. I think that she did a fantastic job conveying Yeah, like like the patriarchy in the show is so like in your face the mach- the machismo like we have we, we have wonderfully wonderful characters like Michiko Atsuko and Pepe Lima but at the but at the at the same time we also see how much violence they are subjected to by the men in their lives right and in partic- in particular Pepe Lima like her character and her relationship with um the, I forgot the name of that guy like the leader of that gang right it's like you know, as great as she was, like she was all, she was also under his control. Like he, she worked as a stripper in his bar. He got like a cut of her money, right? Well, all like while she was stripping, right? So she only got like maybe a, a percentage of what she should have should have earned doing the work that she does, right? You know, and when she when she tried asking for more of her money, like you know, she deserves it. He slapped her. That's something that rang very profound for me, especially, I mean, like, okay, so I'll be perfectly honest with you. Like, as a sex worker, I used to work under a pimp. I know what it's like to have to give your cut of the money over to, you know, the man that is controlling you. And I'm sorry, but, like, this series is very hard to watch 
But I like that it's hard to watch. I like that it's difficult because it makes me address these sort of things that, you know, that I can relate to. Any black and brown woman can really relate to. So that's what I like. So it's just like, you know, you can, you can, I'll put it this way. Something that I did notice was um, the treatment were, was how people would talk about the treatment of Pepe at the hands of her boyfriend, whatever he is to her, you know, and it's just like, well, why didn't she, why didn't she just get out from under him? Why can't she just run away? You know, prior to the experiences that I had had when I was still, I guess, you know, innocent and sheltered and stuff like that, I'd have thought the same thing. But living through these experiences, it's just like you can understand. It gives you a type of mindset where it's just like, well, why couldn't they just leave? Why couldn't she just leave? You know, why don't they just walk away? You know, it's so easy to do that. Not really. And this is like what black women face. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that amongst other black women and brown women where they're just like, well, you could just leave. You could do so much better. And it's just like, well, you know, well, you know, if she stays, she gets everything she deserves, you know, to her, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it's just like, wait, but then you've got the thing where it's just like in black and brown communities, expect expectation of women put up with everything your man does. It's like, wait, wait a second. It's like, where's the balance? Where's the common ground? There is none. It's like, what are you expecting of us? It's like, it's like, what is it? A devil's choice. There is no choice. It's like, what do you expect from us as black and brown women? And that's exact. That's the conundrum that is perfectly played out in this show. I'll definitely be interested to hear about your thoughts on Hiroshi going forward and Michiko and Atsuko's, re Atsuko's relationship as well. Um, to kind, of, we're heading on towards an hour here, so I wanted to ask you guys to close. Um, what are you, what are you kind of hoping for in the next six episodes? I want to see the progression of a strong brown character that I mean, because I'm enjoying the series immensely. I want to see the progression of a strong brown female character make her way and get what she wants. She has every right to wish and dream and hope for that safe space. I don't know of a single black or brown woman that has grown up in her conditions that doesn't. And I want to see, I want to see more progress towards that. I know she's going to have to struggle more. Absolutely, probably. We're going to see a lot more str struggle from her and, of course, Hot Chain as well. But my focus is Michiko. A thousand percent my focus is Michiko right now. And I want to see more progression of her character. I want to see them get even more deep inside of her as a character. As for me, like, um, I have two things to say. Um, like, since this is my second time watching this show, I'm looking forward to really picking up stuff that I didn't really, you know, catch before. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited for that. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to pay attention to Atsuko's character more because I will admit I didn't like I didn't do that as much the first time around. I was more focused on Michiko and Hachin her, and themselves. And uh, the second part I want to say is I kind of like um, I just want to like uh, have a moment to really like um, name like because um, on March on on March 14, 2018, like uh, Mariela Franco, a queer a queer black Brazilian was assassinated in, in mm -hmm. Rio de Janeiro. And, mm -hmm. you know, and it's really hit, like, not just Brazil, but all of us really hard in the communities, both in Latin America, the Caribbean, and abroad. Be and I feel it's really timely that we're talking about Michigo and Hachin, a show that's about fictional Brazil. And, you know, and then we have this real world event mm -hmm. of what happened um, to Mariela Franco and you know since we just had a really great discussion about the the awful violence that black and brown folks go through um, I feel like we have to re remind ourselves mm -hmm. that this violence is still ongoing it's happening and you know and um, I hope we can all do better to like stop this and help each other out especially when we're down you know I don't ex I don't know if we can change the world but at the very least I hope we can hold space for each other beautifully said absolutely amelia you've been kind of quiet how, how are you doing <laughs> i've been listening this is such a great mm -hmm. discussion <laughs> i feel really privileged to be able to hear it firsthand mm -hmm. um honestly i think everything that i would be looking forward to has already been covered i'm with Jax. michiko is a million percent my focus i'm thoroughly enjoying just watching her on screen just watching her is a delight and again for me it's less the the cultural context it just doesn't connect with me so much so it is just seeing somebody who looks somewhat like me represented on screen um her fashion's amazing i'm looking forward to seeing more of that and i'm just also really excited because i know the reputation of yamamoto as a storyteller and i know there are some big 
surprises ahead. I know there are some big character steps and development ahead and I'm so looking forward to all of that but I don't have any specific hopes I'm quite enjoying just taking a back seat on this one and watching it more passively and just enjoying an experience I don't get to have very often I'm really looking forward to the the next podcast ep, honestly uh, I'm uh, yeah. this has been great uh, <laughs> thank you, I'm glad you enjoyed it. yeah thank you both of, uh, th- thanks to both of you for agreeing to uh, be our guests on on this watch along I, I think I think this will make for a really special series no thank you so much for having us this was such an engaging podcast and I loved it oh my gosh thank you so much for like allowing us to do this this was a great conversation <laughs> absolutely yeah thank you very much this is my very first podcast ever so I'm really grateful you would never know that, uh, <laughs> to be invited to have this really great discussion I was super nervous but thanks to good company I was able to just let <laughs> just it all flow out it just came out yeah so. no it, it's great and thank you to all of you out there listeners for joining us if you liked this episode you can find more episodes of our podcast on soundcloud or if you want to read more of our stuff in print uh both Jax and lizzie have contributed articles to the site before and you can find lots of articles on i don't think we have anything on michiko and hachin but by our special guest today as well as other contributors at www.animefeminist.com if you'd like to help us do what we do, we have a Patreon, patreon.com slash anime feminist. Even a dollar a month is something we really appreciate. You know, every one dollar adds up. It helps us pay our editors, our contributors, and the people who are going to put together this podcast. If you want to get a hold of us on social media, we're on Facebook at facebook.com slash anime fem. We are on Tumblr at animefeminist.tumblr.com. And we are on Twitter at twitter.com slash anime feminist, where at time of recording, we've just passed 3,000 followers. And we're very excited about it. So if you are watching along with us on this one, next time we will be watching episodes 7 through 12. So do that. And in the meantime, we'll see you there. Bye.